Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, it's wonderful to see everyone here. Uh, my name is Frank Tramble. I am a Vice President of Communications, Marketing, and Public Affairs here at the university. And in order to start our program, I'd like you all to direct your attention to the screen for a short video. On December 11, 1924, James Buchanan Duke signed the Indenture of Trust, establishing the Duke Endowment. The $40 million endowment was designed to enrich lives by advancing higher education, healthcare, and spiritual life. The endowment was also intended to help orphans, foster children, and family well-being in North and South Carolina. $6 million was directed to establish Duke University. This changed Duke's trajectory forever. Over the past 100 years, the Duke Endowment has remained one of Duke's closest partners in renewing the campus, elevating the student experience, academic scholarship and healthcare, and fostering community partnerships. The endowment support has pushed Duke forward, advancing our mission and strengthening our community. Our shared commitment and values have ensured that humanity benefits from all Duke has and will continue to achieve. In Duke's centennial year, as a world-renowned university and healthcare institution, we look forward to our continuing relationship with the Duke Endowment as we embark on our next century together. Our university hopes James B. Duke would be proud to see that the institution he established has risen with purpose to meet the great challenges of its day, that it continues its commitment to the Carolinas, and positions Duke for even grander things to come. Today marks a, uh, a significant moment in Duke's history, and it is my honor to bring to the podium uh, and your MC for today, uh, President Duke, uh, President uh, Vince Price of Duke University. Good morning, and to those of you who are visiting today, welcome to Duke University. I'd like to offer a special welcome to members of the Duke University Board of Trustees uh, and to the staff and trustees of the Duke Endowment who are here today. Thank you so very much. We're grateful for your work and your dedication to support both Duke University and the Duke Endowment. As you just heard, nearly 99 years ago, James B. Duke signed the indenture of trust, creating the Duke Endowment and setting forth his vision for Trinity College to become Duke University. In founding Duke University, James B. Duke understood that with a wise investment, he could turn his resources into an immeasurably larger return for our region. Throughout our first century, the university and the Duke Endowment have worked together to realize Mr. Duke's vision for transforming the wisdom and talent and ambitions of students, faculty, and staff into a much larger return for society. A significant expansion in his words of human happiness. Today, as both institutions prepare to mark our centennials, we are delighted to announce and celebrate the Duke Endowment's $100 million centennial award in support of the vision for Duke University's second century. Our vision for the university's second century begins and ends with Duke's extraordinary people and is centered around community. Through this vision, we're empowering the work of our faculty and students and staff. We're transforming teaching and learning. We're strengthening our campus community and partnering with purpose here in Durham and beyond. And we're engaging our global network of alumni and friends in extraordinary new ways. This historic and transformative award 
will substantially advance financial support for undergraduate and graduate students, especially those from the Carolinas and graduates of HBCUs and other minority serving institutions. It will allow us to deepen purposeful partnerships and experiential learning opportunities for our students and others in our community. And the award will also honor Wilhelmina Rubin Cook, a former trustee of both the university and the endowment, by making the building that bears her name on our campus a model for 21st century teaching and learning. Today, as we honor Mr. Duke's vision and celebrate our partnership with the Duke Endowment, you'll also have an opportunity to learn about some of the specific ways we're transforming the Duke experience uh, to prepare the world's brightest minds to meet today's critical challenges. And it is now my extraordinary pleasure to welcome to the stage Mr. Charlie Lucas, Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Duke Endowment. Gosh, um, thank you very much, President Price. Um, good morning. Gosh, that was good. Um, as Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Duke Endowment, and on behalf of my fellow trustees and on behalf of the Duke family, uh, we are honored, truly honored, to be here with you today. Uh, on this, as President Price said, um, the Duke Endowment and Duke University share an important and long-standing partnership. Um, on December 11th, 1924, as you just seen, my great-great-granduncle and Trent Jones's great-great-granduncle uh, signed the indenture of trust creating the Duke Endowment and creating Duke University. And through the indenture, Mr. Duke wanted to help all of the people of the Carolinas, not just through higher education, but through investing in healthcare, investing in children and families, and investing in the rural Methodist church. Demonstrating Mr. Duke's and the Duke family's commitment to higher education and solidifying what is now almost a 100 year partnership, Mr. Duke's indenture provided $6 million to create Duke University and build West Campus and rebuild East Campus. And he directed that future support, future support would be provided annually with the approval of the endowment's trustees. Well, we've never stopped that. Coincidentally, um, Mr. Duke's $6 million gift in 1924 would be uh, about $100 million in today's dollars. So in carrying out Mr. Duke's vision to advance educational access and opportunities together, the Duke Endowment and Duke University um, have shared that same vision a single vision for the last 100 years, and that was to make this campus the most vibrant, compelling place for the most talented and ambitious students, faculty, and staff. As noted in the indenture, Mr. Duke had a vision that he wanted the university to hold a place of real leadership in the educational world. Uh, I would say that uh, Duke, has, Duke has achieved that. Uh, over the last century, the endowment has worked with Duke University to support its institutional priorities and has given nearly $2 billion to Duke University since 1924. <laughs> the endowment's gifts over the years have touched all aspects of the university, providing financial support and enhancing the academic experience for undergraduate and graduate students, supporting the recruitment and development of faculty, strengthening programs in the Divinity School, supporting innovation at the Medical Center, endowing professorships and providing faculty support and other academic support at the Law School, the Nicholas School, the Fuqua School, and the Sanford School, and building and renovating critical facilities across the campus. Today, to commemorate our nearly 100-year partnership, the Duke Endowment, is announcing a $100 million gift to Duke University, the largest single gift in the history of Duke University. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
As noted by President Price, this special gift over and above the endowment's traditional grants to the university will significantly increase support for Duke students, especially undergraduate students from the Carolinas and graduate students from HBCUs and minority serving institutions. It will broaden experiential learning opportunities, deepen the university's community partnerships, and honor our beloved Wilhelmina Rubin Cook, a former trustee of the Duke Endowment and Duke University. So as both institutions prepare to celebrate our centennial in, 19, in 2024, we're excited about entering the next century with a renewed and deepened partnership. Today, Duke University is one of the greatest universities in the world. It fulfills Mr. Duke's vision for the institution, and we are certain that he would be pleased. Uh, he would not be surprised, but he also would not want us to rest on our laurels. Mr. Duke would want all of us to push forward. He was a builder, first and foremost, he was a builder, and he would want this institution to continue to develop and grow into what is maybe the greatest institution in the world. So I think we have to all keep in mind that his vision remains true to this day, and it is kind of the magic of the Duke Endowment. All of Mr. Duke's priorities remain relevant today, but particularly Duke University. So the trustees of the Duke Endowment uh, look forward to working with the staff of the Duke Endowment and Duke University, working together to continue to honor his vision, to carry out his goals and his vision, and with this gift of $100 million and the endowment's ongoing support in the future, making Duke the greatest that it can be. With that, I'm so grateful that you all are here today. It's a historic day for the Duke Endowment. It's our largest gift ever, and it's a historic day for Duke University, and I'm so pleased and proud that we can share it together. Thank you. Well, thank you, Charlie, for those thoughtful remarks that uh, so eloquently describe the special relationship between the Duke Endowment and Duke University and the ways that together we are fulfilling Mr. Duke's vision. We're very grateful indeed for the endowment's enduring support of Duke University and so very proud of what this vision and what our partnership are making possible here in the Carolinas and beyond. I am pleased now to introduce a group of Blue Devils whose work and studies here at Duke exemplify the spirit of, uh, to use Charlie's words, pressing forward into the next century. Gary Bennett, the Dean of Trinity College of Arts and Sciences, has worn many hats at Duke. As a student, he earned both a master's degree and a PhD here before returning to join our Duke faculty in 2009. Prior to his appointment as dean, Gary served as our vice provost for undergraduate education, a role in which he led the expansion of several initiatives supporting access and affordability, as well as experiential learning opportunities for all undergraduates. Joining Gary in a conversation about their Duke experiences, our senior Isaiah Hamilton, who is president of the undergraduate student government, and third-year law student Madison Pinckney, whose experiential education at Duke has included work through both the Children's Law Clinic and the Health Justice Clinic. Please join me in welcoming Gary, Isaiah, and Madison. Thank you, Vince, and uh, good morning, everyone. So nice to see you all. They look great, don't they? <laughs> I am uh, just absolutely delighted to be here today to celebrate this very exciting uh, announcement. And I want to thank the Duke Endowment again for bringing us all together today and for the support you all have provided in an ongoing way for so very long. It has been both foundational and transformational for this institution. Uh, that term transformation gets thrown around a lot in higher education. 
Uh, but here it's true. And I can say with great confidence that the thing that keeps me engaged, and I know so many of my colleagues engaged, is the opportunity for us together to transform the lives of students and families through our education, through our research, through innovation, uh, and through the service that we provide to our local community, to the region, uh, and to the world. And you all will forgive me for just a moment, because this announcement is also a bit personal for me. I, uh, I am, in part, I'm a Duke alum because of the generosity of the Duke Endowment. I came here to Duke for graduate study in psychology after graduating from Morehouse College, a liberal arts college that also happens to be an HBCU in Atlanta. And uh, one of the things that made it easy for me to choose Duke, one of the things that really made Duke stand out, uh, was this very creatively named fellowship called the Duke Endowment Fellowship. <laughs> <laughs> Which, which really made this place even more exciting, I, I have to tell you. I did not know at the time what the Duke Endowment represented, uh, but I, I knew that it made the right choice the easy one. Enough about me. I'm here joined by two absolutely tremendous students, Isaiah Hamilton uh, and Madison Pinkney. And this, of course, will be the most exciting part of our, of our morning. Forgive me, Charlie and Vince. Um, <laughs> but, in so many ways, they exemplify what I think of as the Duke difference, and that is our undying, absolute commitment to the student experience. And one of the things that I'm just so excited about this award is that we will have an opportunity to extend the Duke experience to so many more students, especially from North and South Carolina, and in so doing, transform those students' lives and their families' lives, but also send a message more widely that Duke is an affordable and an accessible option. And then once they're here, we'll have a chance to unlock the riches of this place for those students and invite them to work with us as we educate, research, and serve here on campus and beyond. So with that, Madison, can we start with you? Sure. So I am really excited that this gift is going to support the law clinics, which have been spearheaded by, by my colleague and friend, Carrie Abrams. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about them. And, and I think I understood that, that in some ways they drew you here to Duke. Can you share a bit more about that? Yeah. Um, uh, hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, I actually knew coming into law school that I wanted to focus on disability rights. And so when I was picking a law school, I was looking specifically at their clinic work. Um, and Duke is actually one of the few law schools in the country that has multiple clinics that are dedicated to disability and health law, and that's one of the big reasons why I chose to come. Um, and they have not let me down. I've taken um, the Health Justice Clinic, which focuses on um, social security, disability benefits, and then also has a partnership with the Duke Cancer Center to do um, like wills and advanced directives for people. And um, I'm currently in the Children's Law Clinic. I have a meeting with uh, a school this afternoon. And um, mostly for those, um, we're able to support students with disabilities in getting the access to the education that they need to thrive. And um, we're able, as like students through these clinics, to develop really strong subject matter expertise in what we're doing because we each get multiple cases, and a lot of times we follow them through from start to finish. And so those clients interact directly with us, not necessarily our supervising attorneys, and it gives us a really wonderful opportunity to like take responsibility and feel confident when you graduate that you know what you're doing and you can handle um, whatever is thrown at you. That's terrific. That's ter you know, I'm, I'm, I'm married to a lawyer, and when she was in law school, um, I would often ask for technical advice while we were watching Law and & Order. And she would, <laughs> she would tell me all the time that like, law school is designed to make you teach. I mean, to think like a lawyer, not necessarily to do the work. But what I'm hearing about the law clinics is that you're engaged in the work now as a law student. And I imagine also that there's this, there's, you're experiencing connections with communities and, and more broadly with the region. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and whether how that's been important in your learning. I think the clinics um, fill a really critical access to justice gap in North Carolina, and um, we're able to serve individuals who wouldn't be able to afford an attorney, and likely um, either because of the subject matter or because legal aid doesn't have the capacity, they wouldn't be able to get an attorney through them either. And so we have such a breadth of clinics. I mean, we do um, different kinds of housing work, immigration work, I've talked about kind of the health and disability work that we do, 
we you know help um, small businesses and things like that. And so we're able to kind of make, um, hopefully, a big difference in the lives of just um, individuals who wouldn't be able to access the help that they need otherwise. And that's been something that I've really appreciated being a part of. Um, I had, or we're kind of closing off our clinics this week, and so I had a meeting, like one last meeting with one of my clients, and she was just so thankful for our support just because the whole tone of the, between her and her child's school has totally changed just because of like our presence and advocacy and um, taking kind of that burden off for her and knowing that now that we're finished with her case, like things will go forward more smoothly is just something that um, we're really proud of and it's really nice to have the opportunity to do. That's wonderful. So can you talk a little bit about how important experiential learning has been in your legal education? Is this, has this unlocked opportunities that you didn't imagine? It's been more important than I thought that it was going to be. I'm glad that I chose Duke and focused on the clinics when I was um, deciding, but I didn't know how important it was going to be. So um, nonprofit employers and government agencies, they focus really heavily on experiential learning. So what skills do you have, not what classes have you taken? And so a lot of, I'm in the recruitment process now to be a public interest lawyer when I graduate. and every one of my interviews for the past few months have focused on what experiences have you had? Have you written a demand letter? Have you filed a complaint? Have you represented anyone in a hearing? And because I've taken two clinics and I'll take a third one next semester, um, I can say, yes, I have. And you know, every law student usually does some kind of internship over the summer and gets the experiential learning through that. But I've found that to be a competitive public interest candidate because there are so few opportunities, you need to have done more than just what everybody else has done. And so being able to focus on the clinic work that I've done along with um, some of the experiential classes that I've taken has been really incredible. It's terrific. We're happy you choose, chose to as well. <laughs> um, so I, I wonder, you know, one of the things that we prize at Duke, uh, I think in every one of our schools, is the, uh, the relationship with faculty members, mm -hmm. and what I think of as the kind of essential connection between students and faculty members, which we hope, connections that we hope will last a lifetime. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, interactions with faculty and whether they're special relationships that you've formed. Yeah, I um, took the health justice clinic last semester, and um, we had a new director, um, I think last year is when she started, and um, she has been able to help me um, throughout this recruitment process as like somebody who went directly into public interest work herself. Um, and she actually also just started an experiential learning like new class on legislative advocacy where um, we focus on kind of oral and written testimony for different um, bills that we kind of make mock bills and then um, bring them up. And so uh, we did a you know, mock public hearing the other day. And um, I took that with her because I would take any class at this point that she <laughs> offered. Um, and I will actually go back uh, next semester and take her advanced clinic. Um, and that's just something that I've been really fortunate to have. And I know that that's true ac across all of the clinics. I think um, the kind of uh, directors and supervising attorneys and students work really closely together and develop close relationships. That's terrific. Uh, we just love it when you take class after class after <laughs> class like that. So that's, that's absolutely wonderful. Isaiah, do you mind turning to you now? So I wonder if you could just share a little bit about what you've been up to and, um, and importantly, the kind of contributions you've, you've had outside the classroom. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, you know, I think a lot what Madison was touching on and a lot of themes of today has been, you know, the experiential learning. And in a lot of ways, I would argue, uh, you know, I grew up, Duke was a dream school. In a lot of ways, having been here the past four years, um, the most important things I've learned have existed outside of the classroom. It's been in my extracurriculars, having served now this year as president of Duke Student Government, last year as president of the Black Student Alliance, uh, in my um, fraternity Phi Beta Sigma uh, on campus. And it's those experiences where you're not, you know, I, I'm a biology major. I'm not learning about STEM, I'm not learning about any of these things, but it's forging these relationships and allowing us to just exist as our authentic selves 
Um, and you know, that it's that ingenuity that has led to a lot of the change I've seen coming in as a class of 2024. We came in um, peak COVID in 2020. So a lot of things were different. We couldn't even be here right now if it was four years ago. So I, I say that to say that you know, what has led this institution and has led the, my peers um, you know, into this post-COVID phase and this post-COVID world has really been the work outside of the classroom, right? Nothing that we learned within a lecture hall enabled us to do that. So experiential learning has really been everything for me. Um, and it's the leadership, I think, of, of faculty, staff, administrators, and students um, outside you know, of those walls that really have pushed things forward for Duke. Yeah, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more, Isaiah, about leadership and your leadership experiences. And, and just in route to that, I'll say that when you were leading the, the Black Student uh, Alliance, I, you know, we had the experience of working together. And one of the things I, I saw that you, you do in that role was not only to lead your organization, but to bring a whole host of different cultural and identity organizations that sometimes have misaligned interests yeah. together to be able to imagine the ways in which they had, had common bonds. I wonder if you might just talk a little bit about your leadership experience and what Duke has, uh, has afforded in that space. Yeah, and I, I think in my experience uh, in these leadership roles, a lot of it has been coalition building. It's, you know, we're gonna share spaces and, and be in places that would not be conducive if we otherwise weren't in these roles and we weren't at Duke. Um, and, you know, as you were saying for, for BSA, right, it was the goal of, yes, we were the largest black serving organization on campus, but we knew there were so many others who had a voice that wanted to be echoed and amplified. So how can we do that? How can we provide a platform for those who, you know, have historically not had that? Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's exactly been that. It's been building bridges and trying to break down walls. Uh, and I think that's the, the mindset of so many um, of, of you know, other student leaders on this campus. Um, and it's, again, it's those spaces where, you know, there's never a lack of good ideas here. I, I will always say that. So when, you know, you reach out to somebody and you say, hey, let's have a conversation or like, hey, I would like to meet with you to talk about how we can better support you and your, your organization. The answer is never no, right? And, but then what it does is after you get that yes, it begins to just, you see the possibility, right? And like it's that, you know, creation that, that excites us. Um, so in a lot of ways, that's what leadership has been for me. It's about, you know, making a place better than when you found it. Um, and I think that can be a testament to the entire class of 2024 coming in in the, the time period that we did for Duke and now leaving on a much more triumphant centennial. Yeah, that's wonderful. I think that's an essential characteristic of this community, is, a, is an interest in leaving this place better than, than the way you found it. Is it? Um, so I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, what I think of as one of the most exciting parts of this gift, and that is the idea of bringing more students from the Carolinas yeah. here to Duke. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your personal experience and, and uh, the importance of this to you? Yeah, so if I could take a little personal point of privilege, I would like to ask how many people are familiar with Elizabeth City, North Carolina? That's good. That's like the best that result was, I've ever gotten. That was a whole lot more than you thought. Right? Yeah, that yeah. was a whole yeah. lot more than I ever thought. And, and the reason I say that is because I think from my standpoint, there's not a lot of people to be in a position to be able to ask those type of questions, right? Um, I always joke, you know, about like, oh, the 252 being from that area code. Um, and growing up in that, that, that space, right, um, I was quite literally one of one who, you know, wanted to, to, to be a Blue Devil, who saw Duke as, as a dream school. Um, so many of my peers were, were Tar Heels and Wolfpack. Um, and, you know, it was, it was being in a, in a you know. There's, in, a, there's a few of them in here, too. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But, <laughs> but yeah, it, you know, for me it was, it was, there was, you know, I think you could count on your hands, quite literally, the amount of people who have, you know, trailblazed these paths to make institutions such as this. Um, you know, accessible to students such as myself from the Carolinas. Being from rural areas, it was not as if we had a plan B, right? Um, I remember <laughs> electing to not apply to other schools because I was just so determined to be here. And it worked out, but I don't recommend it. But, you know, I, <laughs> but I, I say that because, you know, um, you know it's, it's students such as myself, it's students from these Carolinas or the students from these rural areas that, you know, are one of one or one of few that then have such a strong tie to those communities that go back and can amplify the voice and messaging of Duke um, and can you know, spread that good word. And then the path is trailed. You know, it's blazed for, for years and generations to come. That history has been written, right? Um, so I think you know, making 
um, Duke pushing itself in these spaces is not only essential, but it's crucial to the development of this institution. I think looking ahead for the next 100 years, it's a matter of how can we penetrate these spaces um, and reach students such as myself who were thinking all the way back in elementary school that maybe this is a place for me, but I'm not quite sure, right? And it's that question that, you know, for a kid who doesn't know what they don't know, it's very easy for them to go the wrong direction, right? Or make the wrong choice or to, you know, discount their, their um, potential to be here. And yeah, I think that's exactly what it is. We should be promoting and celebrating these, these students and, and these stories um, and these communities that, again, are really blue collar, are really, you know, workaholics in the sense of, again, we don't really have that plan B of, of you know, going back. That's great. You know, I see Miranda McCall over there who leads our financial aid office, and I'm sure her experience is similar to the one that I've had in this regard, which is after we made the initial announcement, was getting a number of telephone calls from the 252, as you said, um, <laughs> with people on the other line who would say, um, does this mean that if my kid gets into Duke, that they'll actually be able to go? Yep. Right. And, uh, uh, or the calls uh, that we got uh, that said things like, I'm a Duke alum, and this was me. And this would have made it easier for other people in my community to imagine being a blue devil. Yeah. So um, again, in the spirit of leaving this place better than you found it, I think, uh, I think we're on the path there. Yeah. Um, so I want to close by just noting two things. One, I wonder if you can just share that you, uh, you're a little bit about your new job. Okay. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Let me so. just say, around here at this time of year, you're not supposed to ask seniors what they're going to do next <laughs> year. Um, we can do that in this case. So, and, but I'll talk a little bit about about your Duke, uh, your Duke, how your Duke experience positioned you for this opportunity. Yeah. So um, next year, I'll actually be an incoming business technology solutions analyst at Deloitte and the Raleigh office. Um, and for me, again, I mentioned my uh, major and minor, I biology major with a minor in global health. So this is the point where you're probably wondering how are those dots connected? <laughs> uh, and, and I think that is exactly what Duke has offered, right? It's, it's been, you know, I came in diehard pre-med. My mom and my sister were both nurses for decades. And I was kind of voluntold to do that. Uh, and, you know, in, in a lot of ways, it was, again, the, the people I met outside of an academic realm and just, you know, existing in, in a social space um, and even in an advocacy space where it enabled me to start thinking critically in that way or start thinking from a more of a problem solving you know, um, perspective. And it opened my mind to, to that. I don't think if I was at Duke or if I was in the position I am today that I would have even considered the industry yet alone, you know, seeing myself um, in it. So I think, yeah, it's, it's one where you, know, you, you kind of see a lot of people come in freshman year and think they want to do X, Y, and Z, and they graduate and they're, they're way off path, but in a good way, right? It's, it's that, that positive change because Duke leaves an you know, impact on you. It leaves a print on you, and, and vice versa. We leave a print on Duke. So in a lot of ways, you know, we make each other better. It's terrific. Well, I'll say the, the world's a complicated place right now, and it is always easy uh, to be cynical. Uh, but I know what gives me hope and so many of my colleagues hope is the opportunity to spend time with wonderful students like these who are not committed only to their individual achievement, but also to the contributions that they're making beyond these walls. Um, so my thanks to both of you, Madison, to Isaiah, and uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Madison, Isaiah, Gary. Uh, Charlie, for your remark remarks this morning. I have absolute confidence that James B. Duke, were he able to listen to this conversation, would be delighted to hear what's been said today, what's being done today at this university. And I can only imagine how proud he would be of the work of the endowment and Duke University in building on his vision and in 100 years bringing us to a place that uh, could have scarcely been imagined uh, in 1924 here in Durham. Um, and in this gift, uh, this new centennial gift, uh, it's, a, it's not a rebirth, uh, but it is a very strong propellant that will take everything that's been done to places that we can scarcely imagine. I have no doubt uh, of that at all. So this will conclude our formal program. Uh, please join me again in thanking our wonderful partners at the Duke Endowment for this fabulous transformational award.